Hello friends and welcome to my new video in which I will tell you some amazing stories. But before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. So also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories in the comments. Let's get started. The first story is Karen thinks she owns my land when I am the sole owner. I knew my neighbor Karen was going to be a headache the moment I moved into my new home. She would watch me closely from her front window, would question everything I did, and would give me unsolicited advice on how to properly take care of my lawn were all warning signs. In an attempt to avoid any drama, I tried to maintain my distance. I had no idea that the worst was still to come. I made the decision to take on the overgrown hedges in my backyard one brisk Saturday morning. With a sense of accomplishment after every cut, I got to work with my pruning shears and determination. I was in my own happy gardening world, the sun shining and birds chirping. That is, until I heard sirens wail in the distance. I was perplexed when I noticed a police cruiser pulling into my driveway. With serious expressions on their faces, two officers emerged and walked towards me. One of them said, Sir, we received a report of an intruder on this property. I was taken aback. Unwelcome guest, this is my home. With a racing heart, I answered, I live here. Karen stormed over, her face flushed with rage, and broke through her front door before the officers could react. The intruder is that! She screamed and gestured accusingly at me with her finger. All morning long, he has been intruding upon my territory. The officers glanced at me, then at each other. Could you substantiate that this is your property, ma'am? Among them, one inquired. Karen pushed a piece of paper in their direction, but it was obvious she had no solid proof. I calmly took my own papers out of my pocket and gave the cops my ID and the house deed. After realizing the obvious, the officers apologized and walked away, leaving Karen furious. Muttering something about finding the truth, she stormed back inside her home. I dismissed it, thinking that would put an end to her foolishness. Karen, though, had other ideas. She decided to turn my life into a living heck over the course of the following few weeks. She even attempted to sabotage my garden by spraying it with a chemical. She also reported me for noise violations every time I had guests Girota Sates over. She complained to the city about my allegedly messy lawn. Every time, I painstakingly recorded everything and gathered proof. The tipping point was reached when she placed a security camera facing straight into my backyard. That privacy infringement was the decisive factor. I made the decision to act. I assembled all of my supporting documentation and filed a formal complaint with the Homeowners Association. The degree of Karen's harassment astounded the board members. After they started looking into it, they discovered that she had a history of upsetting her neighbors. Karen was consequently penalized severely for her infractions and compelled to take down the intrusive camera right away. The real blow, though, was when she was sued by the Homeowners Association for defamation and harassment. She was ultimately forced to resign from the board and pay a sizable settlement in damages. The neighborhood started to breathe easier after Karen's terror reign ended. She was shunned, and her attempts to cause trouble were greeted with indifference and cold shoulders. To everyone's relief, she eventually moved away and listed her house for sale. The next story is... Night my A.E. whole uncle crossed the line. Hey everyone, it's me again, sharing another story about my A.E. whole uncle, Sor A.U. Unlike most of the other stuff, most of the story is mostly mine this time. So I, 34F, was around 18 or 19 at this point. By now, A.U. had received a cancer diagnosis, which made him even worse. Those who observed his unpleasant behavior usually assumed it was due to his sickness, but my parents and I had different ideas. This was his nature all along. The cancer merely made him less of a filter. Thus, he had been having an affair with this really sexy piece of tweaker trash that I like to call Tammy at this point. Heck, there were times when I even watched her kids. He had, however, determined that exchanging our washer and dryer for hers would be a smart idea. I have no idea why, but I also decided that we should be thankful to him because by doing this, he was being so kind to us. It is important to remember that in addition to having cancer at this specific time, he was also using what we colloquially refer to as the dope in order to comprehend his dot 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 detachment from reality. I detest the material. I detest everything related to it, including being around people who use it. When you're 12, 
Try having to visit your mother in prison on Christmas and tell me how you feel about it. At the time, I wasn't completely cognizant of this. You see, everyone was aware of my feelings regarding illegal substances, and many of the people we knew who used them would, I'm told out of respect, keep it quiet around me. Nevertheless, AU was on point that evening. When he first came to our house to get the washer and dryer, he was cynical and rude. Space was a little tight because we only had one wide mobile home. Dad and I were the only ones in the house. Mom was in the truck he had brought home from his time off as a truck driver across the street. And for reasons I can't recall, Mom had to borrow $500 from AU not too long before this. Later on, this will become somewhat significant. In order to remove the washer and dryer from the house, AU and Dad are making clearance. Choosing to keep out of the way, I'm sitting at the computer tinkering with some images. Logical, isn't that right? AU disagreed. All of a sudden, AU is yelling at me to get off my lazy AEA and assist them. And Dad, my poor, poor Dad. He was at a loss for what to do. As you can see, my dad was not raised in the same manner as my mother and AU. Unlike them, he had no drunken, womanizing, violent father. His childhood was spent in a 1950s sitcom, where the mother would always be there with cookies when the kids got home, and there would never be any awkward conversations at the dinner table. Even after spending so much time with mom, he still struggles to deal with the more aggressive parts of my mom's family. Dad was thus, to put it mildly, shocked when AU started in on me. Startled, he had no idea that AU would treat me in this way. He was unaware that following his illness, AU frequently confused me for my mother. The drugs had no effect. Well, I was immediately enraged by AU's tone, and I was hurt by Dad's startled inaction at the moment. I know now why, but at the time it seemed like he didn't give a D. I was being grumpy, so I went over to help Dad clear stuff out of the way and pick things up. You know, since I had just received needless criticism and scolding. I proceed to grab a piece of cardboard, but I abruptly jerk on it and pull it back. My ear starts ringing the next thing I know, and I have no idea why. Since he is the only person nearby, I turn to face my dad, and even in my stunned state, I manage to piece together that he struck me. However, before AU emerges screaming from the laundry room, I have no time to inquire as to why. I can't even begin to understand what he was saying, and before I know it, he's kicking me out of my own house. I was just going to take a short stroll down the road until I felt more at ease and then I was going to get in the truck with my mom. I just wanted to cool down, let go of my anger, and clear my head before telling mom everything. I ought to have just gone to the truck right away. Heck, I probably would have chosen violence sooner rather than having it selected for me if this had happened to me now. After a few minutes, I believe my dad is coming to talk to me because I see headlights coming from our house. It was nighttime. But no, he's furious, and it's AU. After getting out of his pickup, he yells at me to get back in the truck so we can clean up the house. I inform him that I will not be leaving him behind. At that point, he grabs me, and the fight starts. He's trying everything to get me into his truck, and even though I'm not sure why, I still feel like I might not be telling you this today if I had followed him. My gut was screaming at me to stay away from him. I thus fought and struggled with him. It makes no difference to me that he was ill, or that he was meant to be family. I had trouble. Reddit users, I made terrible remarks while we were fighting. I mentioned that mom was going to bury him. I told him how much I despised him, calling him a bastard with cancer who deserved to be ill. Even though I was terrified for my life that evening, I'm not proud of the things I said. AU had struck me in the face somewhere during the struggle. At some point, AU got up, got into his truck, drove back to his house, and dropped me off. I walked back to where mom was, inside my dad's large truck. I looked like I had just stepped out of a horror film, and I was crying. I can still picture my mother's expression, the fury and the terror. She gave me a quick hug, and I started crying. The kind of crying you only get when your mother is around, because you can just stop trying to be strong for a while and start to lose it. Abruptly, AU appears and begins claiming that he didn't touch me. I had told mom everything I'd been crying over. He genuinely believed his mother would accept it. Adolescents avoid using illegal substances as they can lead to violence and stupidity. In order to get me home and clean up, mom lets AU off our backs for the time being. Fortunately, my nose wasn't broken, but there is some blood where there wasn't any before this incident, 
especially when springtime sinus problems arise, something that would serve as a reminder of him. Her first target of resentment after I told her everything was Dad. Do you recall when, earlier in the story, he hit me? He must have acted instinctively when I jerked that cardboard up because he caught a glimpse of me out of the corner of his eye and thought I was going to strike him. To be fair, I am inclined to believe it because that was the only instance in my life that he had physically touched me. He also mentioned how AU's actions had startled him and made him freeze like a deer in headlights. He lost something that night, his mother informed him, that I wouldn't be able to rely on him to stand up for me if it came to that. What do you know? To tell you that she was correct breaks my heart. Though I adore my dad, I wouldn't turn to him for support in a situation like that. I discovered that evening that I am the only person I can rely on to stand up for myself. And no, it didn't really lead to anything. We were pretty much powerless against AU because, as I mentioned, mom was still in debt to him. She did, however, threaten to cut off communication with him if he touched me again. Ultimately, it was just another incident that we all chose to pretend never occurred in order to keep the peace. You described your internal experiences and the struggle for your own safety and shared important conclusions you have drawn. Your story about your interaction with AU is very emotional and vulnerable. It is important to trust yourself and be prepared to defend yourself in difficult situations. You even mentioned the fact that after the incident with AU, you could not even count on your own father for protection. I am sorry that this happened in your family, but now you know that you always have you. Your mother has been a great support to you, and you have learned an important lesson about your own independence in protecting your own identity. This story is tragic, but it also conveys an important lesson about strength, survival, and the importance of self-defense. Your openness and self-confidence deserve respect. May your future journey be filled with powerful moments and support. The next story is chaos of Karen and her children in a flower shop. This incident occurred in middle school when community service was mandatory for academic credit. I had the unfavorable experience of working with Karen, who became enraged with the workshop coordinators for asking their well-behaved children to assist with the workshop while allowing her own hobgoblins to run wild and topple plants. I'll admit that my resume is more filled with volunteer work than paid employment, so this was new for me. Prior to this experience, I didn't do much volunteer work. The few times I did, it was for church functions or family members. I spent the entire morning helping customers load their plants into their cars or assisting with checkout. When there weren't many customers, I would also water the plants and rearrange them to make room for new ones. When Karen finally showed up, we knew something was wrong because she stormed up and looked down at us like we were filthy peasants. While I and the other volunteers were moving things around, Karen approached us and yelled, Excuse me, where are more of these type of plants? She glances around at the plants, scowling at the coordinator's children and complaining to herself about something. While she is holding a pot in front of us, I glance at the tag and go look for the plant. When I get back, Karen has gone somewhere and I'm unable to locate her, so I leave to finish organizing the space. Karen. Hi. Where's that plant I requested? Me. What? Well, I was out of luck, but I'm sure the coordinator has more in their cars. Karen. All right, then go fetch me two more pots. Make sure there are no dead leaves on them. I need them to be fresh. Me. You can ask the coordinator directly. I'm not sure where their car is. Soon after, Karen demands that we assist her in loading the plants into her car after paying for some of the plants she was admiring. Karen just huffs and puffs away, so I simply return to what I was doing. The other volunteers and I helped load the pot into her car as we approached it because we weren't too busy and the workshop was about to close. As we load the plants into the car, Karen opens the door and lets the kids run around while we hear some kids yelling and screaming from the car, asking to see the plants before they leave. The children can be heard running among the plant rows as we approach the workshop. They are even moving the tags on the pots, and the hobgoblins have started pushing the pots across the stalls, many of which are dangerously close to toppling over. If the coordinator paid a lot of money and spent hours growing, so we had to run over and catch it before the pots fell off the stalls, warning them not to shake or push the pots around. The coordinator saw this and instructed Karen to watch her children because Karen had returned to do some additional shopping. Karen, well, why should I have to watch my kids when you have a ton of babysitters? Surely they could watch my kids too, rather than just loitering around all day. Coordinator, these teenagers are high school students volunteering. They are not our babysitters. Karen, 
All right, just tell them to watch my kids. While her children are running around uncontrollably and even playing hide-and-seek among the stall stands, bumping into each other, or ducking under the stands to hide from one another, Karen just walks away and keeps staring at the plants. Me. Hey, kids, please stop hiding beneath the stalls. You're knocking into the stalls, which is shaking the pots. And we don't want the pots to fall to the floor. Hobgoblin won. However, my mother says we can play anywhere we like, and these tables are great for hiding under. Me. You might have been allowed to play here by her, but be careful. There are heavy pots that could easily fall on your heads and injure you. Now, kindly refrain from crawling under here and avoid running into them. Just as I'm finishing up, there's a loud crash and children laughing and running off. I look over and see that there is dirt spilling onto the ground from a pot that has fallen. I quickly look for an empty pot to put the plant in, being cautious not to damage the roots. Soon after I've finished, I notice that the hobgoblins have stopped, but Karen is still browsing which raised my suspicions because I've babysat most of my younger cousins, so I figure they might be up to no good. When I wave over to the coordinators to ask if they moved the pots that were set up back there, they tell me they haven't, and that's when we hear kids laughing a few feet away. I'm heading towards the back rows of plants. The coordinator becomes enraged and yells at the little goblins for damaging their plants, which causes the goblins to start crying and running to Mama Karen. We follow the giggling to discover that Karen's hobgoblins had ripped the plants out of the pots and were playing with the dirt. When the other coordinators arrive to assess the situation, they bring a dustpan and extra dirt bags to fill the pots. While the volunteers and I are tidying up the mess, we hear Karen yell angrily, Who dares to yell at my babies? This is what I recall of the conversation when the coordinator goes to speak with Karen. Karen, hello guys? Personally, who caused my babies to cry? A sane brat threatening to drop a pot on my baby was that. I tell Karen that I wouldn't say that, that I had only warned the children about the possibility of the clay pots falling on their heads, and that I look at her from the mess with a WTF expression on my face. Fortunately, the coordinator didn't buy Karen's BS and told her that I hadn't said anything like that. Karen, well, I guess you don't mind losing service when I report you to your boss because you're supporting the insane because you don't mind them stealing your job. Coordinator, Feel free to report me, as we are the ones in charge of organizing this workshop, rather than a real company. You are free to keep the plants you purchased and depart, as we disapprove of your unfounded accusations and bigotry directed at our volunteers. Fortunately, the pots Karen knocked over were not very high off the ground, so she didn't break. However, Karen chose to be even more petty by tossing the other plants from the back of her car and smashing them in the parking lot before she stormed off. Karen became even more enraged, and the coordinators were forced to call the police to make her leave, before she stormed back to us demanding a refund, which I don't think Karen got because they had a no-refund policy or something I don't remember. Before we could leave ourselves, the coordinators and I had to stay an additional hour to clean up the dirt, repot Karen's plants, remove the other plants, and load them back onto their cars. Edit. When the police arrived, I was told, along with the other volunteers, not to get involved and to concentrate on cleaning up. From what I recall, Karen had yelled at us about trying to drag her kids away in an attempt to traumatize them, and I had denied throwing a pot at her children for accidentally bumping into the stalls. The coordinators supported us, gave the police an explanation, and, I believe, made Karen pay for the items she damaged and the plants her goblins uprooted. I'm positive they charged her because... I recall the police observing me and the other volunteers cleaning in the background. The coordinators confirmed that we were volunteers, and they also noticed that I couldn't throw the clay jar because it was half the height of me. I'm a short girl. They could tell I couldn't throw it if I wanted to because they saw me straining to move the pot after repotting the uprooted plants her goblins were playing with. Reading it, I felt like I was experiencing a mixture of emotions from laughter to numbness. It's incredible how one person can create such chaos in such an ordinary place. It's especially interesting how you convey the reaction of the coordinators and your attempts to maintain order. And these little goblins, as you call them, added to the poignancy of your story. The description of your efforts to interact with Karen, including her hostile stare and instructions, only adds to the impression of her troubles. It seems like Karen was not only unhappy that you weren't her personal babysitters, but she decided to put on a whole performance of rejection about the rules. It's appalling how she even uses elements of racism in her attempt to justify her aggression. 
I hope that you and the other volunteers manage to overcome all the difficulties and keep your nerves in check despite the chaos in the flower shop. The next story is ex mil attacked my best friend. This is still a mess, involving my best friend F-29's ex-partner M-29 and now her ex mil Although my best friend didn't marry her ex, I'll call her ex's parents ex mil and XFL to keep things simple. My best friend and I recently purchased a house together with our parents. By now, we've become platonic life partners, and she practically feels like my parents' daughter. After learning that we had purchased a home, her ex-boyfriend stalked her for three years, trying to convince her to move back in with him. We've attempted to contact the police, but since nothing significant has occurred, we've hit a wall and are forced to wait. Although they don't currently reside in the U.S., her ex-in-laws visited for Thanksgiving. Despite the fact that my best friend is no longer seeing their son, she offered to drive them to their hotel from the airport. I was informed that they would take care of her during her college years. She wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to ask her ex's parents to step in and possibly get him off her back, which bothered me because her ex is a problem. Though from her description, I think they were probably okay, even though I still didn't like it. And I was entirely mistaken. My closest friend showed up crying and with a scratched cheek. I'm blushing now that I asked her what had happened right away. The following is based on what my best friend told me. My best friend informed me that picking them up went smoothly and they had caught up on old times. My best friend, being her usual self, decided to treat them to lunch when they asked if they could stop at a nearby restaurant they always liked. But at the restaurant, chaos reigned. Evidently, her former mother-in-law asked her best friend why she did not take her abusive stalker ex back. Since my best friend was my boyfriend's first girlfriend, and they were married in the eyes of God. My ex Mill claims that my friend is to blame for her baby boy. They never get married legally to start. Best friend is also an atheist. Thus, yeah. In an attempt to defuse the tension, best friend said that she had moved on from the three years she had spent not knowing where he was. She made an attempt to persuade her son to leave her alone by asking her ex Mill but her best friend simply no longer wants him in her life. Her ex-father-in-law appeared to concur with her and expressed regret for the suffering and heartache she endured. But my best friend gave the ex Emil the upper hand, yelling that her son had no life because of her, that my best friend was allegedly to blame for her firstborn daughter not having a spouse or kids. She owed him nothing more than to accept responsibility and turn into the obedient wife he so richly deserved. Ex file attempted to yank his spouse away, probably due to the fact that they were making a lot of news. My friend said bluntly that she would never consider getting married to her ex. Then she suggested that they head to their hotel and take the food to go. Despite the ex files offer to pay for his and his wife's meal, she paid for everything and drove them to the hotel. Things went from 1 to 100 at the hotel. Ex mill had been increasing demands the entire drive. Taking him back, getting married, having a kid, and giving her son the house as the man in the relationship are all examples of this. She was obviously told to stop by her exville, but she was unable to remain silent. My best friend finally had enough, pulled over the car, and told her ex Emil that she would never marry a failure of a man like her baby boy, much less have a child by him. He really won't be a good addition to the gene pool, so she was relieved that no other woman had stayed with him for an extended period of time. Unashamedly, I'm proud of her on that final one. My friend's ex Mill lost it and jumped on her. Despite her husband's fortunate grab of her, she managed to kiss my friend on the cheek. She started yelling that she was the cause of her family's dissolution, called her a whore, using a different term, and expressed her desire for our house to burn down while we were all inside. While he restrained his demon of a wife, my friend's ex-father-in-law instructed them to leave their bags on the sidewalk and drive away and best friend did just that. She then made her way back to us by car. The idea that a woman she had once considered a second mother would treat her in such a way hurt her more than the insults or even the attack itself. She's watching movies with the dogs while I write this and take care of some work because I told her to just unwind for a little while. We're both going to call out and just hanging out as girls with my mom tomorrow. I did inform the ex's sister of what had happened by getting in touch with her. She asked me if my best friend was filing charges since she already knew from her dad. She ought to, but she doesn't. 
I made an effort to persuade her, but she finds the subject painful, so I won't press the issue out of concern for her mental health. The sister expressed her gratitude that we are not pursuing legal action and promised to ensure that her family doesn't cause us any trouble. It seems that she had already relocated her brother outside of the city. I'm relieved he's gone, even though I'm not sure how or where he went. I hope this means we're done. Until we have confirmation that the ex-monster-in-law has left the city, we will refrain from going out too much. Though it's by no means a small city, I wouldn't rule out these crazy people trying to stalk my best friend. Update. My mom and my best friend had a serious conversation over dinner on Thanksgiving. She informed her that although she didn't want to diagnose her, therapy might be an option because there were obvious signs that she needed assistance. After talking about it, my friend decided to get help from a professional. She isn't an option because she lives with my mom, but my mom will assist her in finding a partner. We just finished reporting something to the police. We created a paper trail to make sure that it is at least on record, even though my friend refuses to press charges. She expressed regret for not acting on it right away and for seeing her ex-in-laws. I told her that I knew how much she was going through. I won't let her go through it alone. She's like a sister to me. We'll see how things work out. Please stop saying things like, I have feelings for her. Like, really, give up. I don't see her as romantic. She's my family. Regarding the commenter's assessment of her ex-in-laws as entitled or Muslim, that statement is both incredibly racist and inappropriate. Because we're Hispanic, my friend and I constantly have to deal with the same mindset. I detest these kinds of people so much. Second update. Not much to report. My best friend is making progress with her therapy appointment. There hasn't been a significant, she's all better and back to how she was shift because she just started. My parents and I will be there for her every step of the way, even though it probably will take months. Though the ex-SIL informed us through a mutual friend that her parents had passed away and that we would never hear from them or the rest of her family again, we have not received a word from the insane ex of Mill or her son. I thank her in return, but I also hope that this is our last communication together. My best friend had to ban every member of that family from all of her social media accounts, as my parents and I insisted, and she complied. Though it was swept under the domestic matter umbrella, we did visit the police once more. We're still working hard to obtain a RO, and maybe next year we'll be able to schedule a court date. The procedure is quite drawn out. It is important that you support her and try to provide her with the help she needs including a recommendation for professional psychological support. It is also valuable that you have decided to create a paper trail with the police, even if your friend does not want to report her ex-partner. This may prove useful in the future. The next story is Hospital Barista's Encounter with an Entitled Visitor. I used to work at a coffee shop housed within a large medical facility. The hospital itself does not employ its staff. The small business is the sole party to which the baristas are contracted, and none of them are authorized to go to any location that isn't already open to the public. The majority of the baristas were able to access locations that were convenient or significant. The cafeteria, gift shop, elevators, nearest entrance, main entrance, restrooms on our floor, etc. But none of us were familiar with the hospital's layout because we aren't permitted inside the majority of it. Because our cafe is in a more central location than the information desks and a couple of college students in aprons, are far less intimidating than hospital security guards, people frequently ask the baristas for directions. The hospital has plenty of maps and is fairly well labeled, but it can be confusing because visitors are frequently not in the best of moods when they are there. We make an effort to be as helpful as we can while attempting to downplay rudeness. Usually, it isn't an issue, typically. In case you were unaware, hospitals are essentially run on coffee. Long and stressful shifts are worked by doctors, specialists, nurses, technicians, guards, and receptionists, among others. Our island counter, which is stocked with a variety of creamers and sweeteners, needs to be refilled often during busy times at the shop. A frequent customer asked me to replenish the sugar shakers and bring out a fresh canister of 2% milk during one of these rushes. I came out to restock the counter when my coworker offered to make the orders we had already taken. As I was wiping down the counter after refilling everything, Entitled Lady, E.E.L., caught sight of me. I turned to head back to the register area behind the main counter, and that's when she approached me. E.L., pardon me, may I get you to room number? 
I can't recall the exact number, but other than the fact that it began with the number 4, it's not really relevant. Me. I apologize. I'm not sure where that is, and I can't get around most of this place. Given that it begins with 4, I figure it's on the 4th floor. Perhaps a volunteer or a guard could help you find your way. She moved back in front of me to block me as we were speaking, even though I was trying to move around her to get back to work. Yell, that's absurd. You work in a hospital, but are you unfamiliar with its layout? Keep me from laughing. Me. No, really, I'm not. Uh, I have to see my father, who was admitted last night. I need you to show me to his room immediately. Me. Ma'am, I'm not allowed in. I'm just a barista. L. I'll fire you if you don't stop being such a jerk. Me. Thank you, ma'am. Yell. Who oversees you? I need to get to my father, but you won't bring me to him. You're not at all sympathetic. What about you is wrong. It was becoming quite clear that I was being harassed at this point. It was evident to those in line that something was wrong, but none of them spoke up because they didn't want to lose their place. While one of the nurses was waiting on her order, my coworker went into the back to call security and began walking down the hall toward the closest security station. I just kind of give up and stop talking, knowing that help is on the way. EL is facing me, facing the shop, so it's unlikely that she is aware that she is in trouble. She is enraged that I am no longer replying to her. Shortly after receiving a reprimand, I witnessed the nurse coming back accompanied by two security personnel, G1, a senior staff member, and G2, a relatively new employee, observing him. G1, what's happening? G1 one shifts to the front of me so she can't yell at me directly. Before she can finish asking me if I'm okay, G2 turns to face me. L, at last, this worker won't assist me in finding my father's room. He needs me because he is ill. I have to go see him after talking to her manager. His room is number. G1, please ma'am, settle down. She is the coffee shop manager. This is Red Riding Wolves. She can assist you if you're in need of coffee or if there's an issue with anything you purchased from the cafe. You cannot be taken to your father by her. That area is only accessible to authorized visitors and relevant staff. EL, that is absurd. Since she is employed by the hospital, why can't she drive me to my appointments? Avoid G1. Ma'am, you might not be allowed back if my colleague and I have to escort you off the property if you don't calm down. Ask a volunteer at an information center if you need assistance finding a room. As EL is occupied with sulking at G1, G2 follows me to my counter so I can resume my work. In the end, G1 walked her to an information center and G2 watched my colleague and me. As a thank you, we made them their customary drinks on the house. I instructed my coworkers to make sure the nurse who delivered them received her next drink on the house as well. I'm okay with EL being prohibited from the hospital campus, as far as I know. I'm aware that people don't always act appropriately when under a lot of stress. I just hope her father's recuperation wasn't hampered by EL. Edit. I had maybe a dozen people in her league of nasty during my five-plus years of employment at that hospital, and she was by far the worst. There have been a few instances where someone who behaved rudely, sometimes so slightly that I didn't even notice the supposed offense, came back and expressed regret for their actions. Receiving additional tips or even small gifts as a form of compensation for their actions was not unheard of. When I think of someone like that, that's the kind of person that comes to mind. I understand that this woman probably wasn't that kind of person, but sometimes you have to justify things to make yourself feel better. In my case, at least for this job, that meant giving myself a few lines to convince myself that people might not be as bad as they actually are. I realize it's an exercise in disappointment, but it helped me get through some difficult periods. Edit 2. I didn't get upset over things like this very often, and even when I did, I usually forgot about it after an hour. However, there was something peculiar about this woman's demeanor and voice tone. I'm still offended by it. I wear a uniform, as do all the staff members, with the exception of a few social workers and religious advisors. I mean, I had on an apron, blue jeans, and a uniform t-shirt. She was adamant that she was correct, even though it was obvious that I had no business being around patients. Not sure. If there hadn't been a rush, I doubt I would have worried as much. She was purposefully obstructing my ability to get as much done as quickly as possible, because I know how little time employees have for breaks, if any. Even though I'm sorry for whatever she and her father may have been going through, she shouldn't be able to vent on me, especially since I'm trying to help those who are caring for patients who are just like him. Edit 3. 
The gift shop resembles a miniature CVS in many ways. It sells sanitary products, small medical equipment, gifts for new parents, toys for infants and young children, snacks and drinks, phone chargers, and other items. Since a lot of people will drop everything to be with their loved one and you can't exactly do laundry in a hospital, they also carry very basic, inexpensive clothing and bathroom supplies. I believe the majority of their revenue comes from the over-the-counter medications they offer, such as single-serve packets of Tylenol, Advil, and other similar products, as well as items like Band-Aids and Neosporin. You must purchase these items if you want to bandage your paper cuts or have a headache because the hospital is not allowed to provide them if they are not prescribed. Interacting with a woman who demanded that you take her to her father's room was quite tense. You showed how people, even in difficult moments, can show dissatisfaction and even aggression without understanding the situation. It is important that the hospital security service intervened in time and protected you from trouble. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe, like, comment. See you soon.